Andre Rublev features a collection of short stories in the medieval age. I will be combining a variety of sources, accounts, reactions, and interpretations in order to give you the most well-rounded approach to the film. Let's begin. Andrei Rublev is a 1966 Soviet epic biographical historical drama film directed by Andrei Tarkovsky, who co-wrote it with Andrei Konchalovsky. The film was re-edited from the 1966 film titled The Passion. According to Andrei by Tarkovsky, which was censored during the first decade of the Brezhnev era in the Soviet Union, the film is loosely based on the life of Andrei Rublev, a 15th century Russian icon painter. The film features Anatoly Solonitsyn, Nikolai Grinko, Ivan Lapikov, Nikolai Sergeyev, Nikolai Berlyayev, and Tarkovsky's wife, Irma Rausch, Sava Yamshikov. A famous Russian restorer and art historian was a scientific consultant of the film. Andrei Rublev is set against the background of Russia in the early 15th century. Although the film is only loosely based on the life of Andrei Rublev, it seeks to depict a realistic portrait of medieval Russia. Tarkovsky sought to create a film that shows the artist as a world historic figure and Christianity as an axiom of Russia's historical identity during a turbulent period of Russian history. In addition to treating the artist as a world historic figure, Tarkovsky also sought to detail and investigate the intersection between faith and art history. In his book Sculpting in Time, Tarkovsky writes, it is a mistake to, to talk about the artist looking for his subject. In fact, the subject grows within him like a fruit and begins to demand expression. It is like childbirth. The poet has nothing to be proud of. He is not master of the situation, but a servant. Creative work is his only possible form of existence, and his every work is like a deed he has no power to annul. For him to be aware that a sequence of such deeds is due and right, that it lies in the very nature of things, he has to have faith in the idea, for only faith interlocks a system of images. In Andrei Rublev, Tarkovsky depicts the philosophy that faith is necessary for art, thereby commenting on the deserved role of faith in the secular, atheist society he was in at the time of the film's creation. Due to the film's themes, including artistic freedom, religion, political ambiguity, and autodidacticism, it was not released domestically in the Soviet Union under the doctrine of state atheism until years after it was completed, except for a single 1966 screening in Moscow. A version of the film was shown at the 1969 Cannes Film Festival, where it won the Fipresky Prize. In 1971, a censored version of the film was released in the Soviet Union. The film was further cut for commercial reasons upon its US release through Columbia Pictures in 1973. As a result, Several versions of the film exist. Although these issues with censorship obscured and truncated the film for many years following its release, the film was soon recognized by many Western critics and film directors as a highly original and accomplished work. Even more since being restored to its original version, Andrei Rublev has come to be regarded as one of the greatest films of all time and has often been ranked highly in both the sight and sounds critics and directors polls. Andrei Rublev has a prologue and an epilogue only loosely related to the main film. The main film was divided into seven episodes dealing, directly or symbolically, with transitional moments in the life of the great icon painter Rublev. The background is 15th century Russia, a turbulent period characterized by fighting between rival princes and the Tartar invasions. The plot centers on the life of the icon painter Rublev. It consists of an introduction in eight short stories and covers the first quarter of the 15th century. The action consistently develops against the backdrop of the internecine rivalry for power between the sons of Dmitry Donskoy, Grand Duke Vasily Dmitrievich, and the Little Prince Yuri Dmitrievich, as well as against the backdrop of the struggle between Orthodox Christianity and the remnants of paganism. A hot air balloon is tethered to the spire of a church next to a river, with a man named Yefim suspended from it in a harness. Despite interference from an ignorant mob who arrived from the river, the balloon is successfully released. Yefim is overwhelmed and delighted by the view from above and the sensation of flying, but he cannot prevent a crash landing shortly after. He is the first of several creative characters, representing the daring escapist 
whose hopes are easily crushed. After the crash, a horse is seen rolling on its back by a pond. Part 1. The Jester, Summer 1400. Andre, Daniel, and Kiro are wandering monks and religious icon painters, looking for work. The three represent different creative characters. Andre is the observer, a humanist who searches for the good in people, and wants his art to inspire and not frighten. Daniel is withdrawn and resigned, bent less on creativity than on self-realization. Kiro lacks talent as a painter, yet still strives to achieve prominence. He is jealous, self-righteous, very intelligent, and perceptive. The three have just left the Andronikov Monastery, where they have lived for many years, heading to Moscow. During a heavy rain shower, they seek shelter in a barn, where a group of villagers is being entertained by a jester. The jester, or Skomorok, is a bitterly sarcastic enemy of the state, the boyars, and the church, who earns a living with his scathing and obscene social commentary. He lightly mocks the monks as they come in. Kiro voices his disapproval of jesters and leaves unnoticed. Shortly after, a group of soldiers arrive and arrest him, knocking him unconscious and smashing his musical instrument. During a momentary break in the rain, Kiro returns and induces his fellow monks to leave. Theophan, the Greek Summer, Winter, Spring, and Summer, 1405-1406 to Kiro arrives at the workshop of master painter Theophan, the Greek, who is working on a new icon of Jesus Christ. Theophan is portrayed as a complex character, humanistic and God-fearing in his views, yet somewhat cynical and disillusioned with other people, regarding his art more as a craft and a chore. His young apprentices have all run away to the town square, where a wrongly convicted criminal is about to be tortured and executed. Kiro talks to Theophanes, who is impressed by the monk's understanding and erudition and invites him to work as his apprentice on the decoration of the Cathedral of the Annunciation in Moscow. Kiro eventually accepts, on the condition that Theophanes will personally tender the offer in the Andronikov Monastery in front of the, of the fraternity in Andrei Ublov. Andrei has become renowned for his icon painting in the outside world, an admiration shared by Kiro and Theophanes. A messenger from Theophan subsequently arrives at the Andronikov Monastery, but hires Andre instead of Kirill. Daniel refuses to accompany Andre and reproaches him for accepting Theophan's offer without considering his fellows, but soon repents of his temper and tearfully wishes Andre well when the younger monk comes to say goodbye to his friend. Kirill is jealous of Andre and in a fit of anger, decides to leave the monastery for the secular world, throwing accusations of greed in the face of his fellow monks. Who also dismiss him. Kiro's dog tries to follow him into the countryside, but he savagely beats it with his walking stick and leaves it for dead. Part 3 The Passion, 1406. Andre leaves for Moscow with his young apprentice Foma. While walking in the woods, Andre and Foma have a conversation about Foma's flaws. In particular, lying. While Foma has a talent as an artist, he is less interested in the deeper meaning of his work and more concerned with the practical aspects of the job, like perfecting his use of unstable azure pigment. They encounter Theophanes in the forest, and the old master sends Foma away, unimpressed by his attitude to art. As he leaves, the apprentice finds a dead swan and fantasizes about having a bird's eye view. In the forest, Andre and Theophanes argue about religion, while Foma cleans his master's paintbrushes. Theophanes argues that the ignorance of the Russian people is due to his stupidity, while Andre says that he doesn't understand how he can be a painter and maintain such views. This section contains a passion play or a reenactment of Christ's crucifixion on a snow-covered hillside which plays out as Andre recounts the events of Christ's death and expresses his belief that the men who crucified him were obeying God's will and loved him. Part 4. The Holiday, 1408. Camping for the night on a river bank, Andre and Foma are collecting firewood for their traveling party when Andre hears the distant sounds of celebration further upstream in the woods. Going to investigate, he comes upon a large group of naked pagans who are conducting a lit torch ritual for Kupala night. Andre, intrigued and excited by the behavior of the pagans, is caught spying on a couple making love. He is imprisoned, his arms tied to a crossbeam in a mockery of Jesus' crucifixion and threatened with drowning in the morning. A woman named Marfa, dressed only in a fur coat, approaches him who responds with hostility. After lamenting that her people are persecuted for their beliefs, she drops her coat, 
kisses him, and then frees him. Andre runs away and gets lost in the dense woods, only finding his group the next morning. As they leave on their boats, they see a group of soldiers pursuing several of the pagans, including Marfa. Her lover is captured, but she escapes into the river, swimming right by his boat. He and his fellow monks look away, in shame. Part 5. The Last Judgment, Summer, 1408 Andre and Danil are working on the decoration of a church in Vladimir, but the production has stalled for two months. Andre confides to Danil that the task disgusts him and that he is unable to paint a subject such as The Last Judgment as he doesn't want to terrify people into submission. He comes to the conclusion that he has lost the ease of mind that an artist needs for his work. A messenger, Patrique, arrives with word from the bishop who is furious to say they have until autumn to finish the job. Foma, impatient and wanting to work, leaves Andre's group and takes an offer to paint in a smaller, less prestigious church. Elsewhere, stone carvers and decorators of Andre's party have finished adorning the mansion of the Grand Duke. To their indignation, the Duke is dissatisfied with their work and tries to make them do it again. The artisans refuse and leave promising that their new client, the Duke's brother, will have a more splendid house than the one they have just finished. In the forest, they are waylaid and blinded by the Grand Duke's henchmen, leaving them incapable of practicing their craft. Back at the church, Andre is dismayed by the news of the attack on the artisans and angrily throws paint on one of the walls. Sergei, a young apprentice who escapes the assault unharmed, reads a random section of the Bible aloud at Daniil's request concerning women. A young woman, Durochka, whose name identifies her as a holy fool, wanders in to take shelter from the rain and is upset by the sight of the paint on the wall. Her feeble-mindedness and innocence inspires in Andre the idea to paint a feast. Part 6. The Raid, Autumn 1408 While the Grand Duke is away in Lithuania, his power-hungry younger brother forms an allegiance with a group of Tartars and raids Vladimir. The invasion of the combined armed forces, their men on horseback, results in great carnage and the burning of the city. One scene shows a horse falling from a flight of stairs. Foma escapes the chaos in the city and goes into the nearby countryside, but as he is crossing a river, he is killed by an arrow. The Tartars force their way into the barricaded church, now fully decorated with Andre's paintings, where the majority of the citizens have taken refuge. Showing no mercy, the Tartars massacre the people and burn all the painted wooden altar pieces. Andre, who is also in the church, saves Jurochka from being raped by a Russian soldier by killing him with an axe. The bishop's messenger, Patrike, is also present. He is tortured, but refuses to reveal the location of the city's gold. Eventually, they kill him by pouring hot liquid metal from a melted crucifix into his mouth. In the aftermath, only Andre and Durochka are left alive in the church. Andre imagines a conversation with the dead Theophans the Greek, lamenting the loss of his work and the cruelty of mankind, while Durochka distractedly plates the hair of a dead woman. Andre decides to give up painting and takes a vow of silence to atone for his killing of another man. Part 7 Silence, Winter 1412 Note, in the 205 minute version known as The Passion According to Andre, this episode is titled The Charity. Andre is once again at the Andronikov Monastery as famine and war grip the country. He no longer paints and never speaks and keeps Doroshka with him as a fellow companion in silence. In the same monastery, refugees discuss the problem plaguing their respective hometowns. One man, who escaped from Vladimir, is recognized by a younger monk as the long-absent Kuril. He has suffered during the time away from the monastery and begs the Father Superior to allow him to return. After initial rejections, his wish is granted, but he is instructed to copy out the Holy Scriptures 15 times in penance. Soon, a passing group of Tatars stop at the monastery, much to the concern of Andre and Kirill, who have experienced their brutality firsthand. Durochka has no understanding or memory of what the Tatars did and interacts freely with the group. The men taunt and play with her, and she is fascinated by one warrior's shining breastplate. Taking a liking to her, the tatter adorns her with a blanket and his horned helmet, promising to take her as away as his eighth and only Russian wife. Delighted with the gifts, she rides away with the tatters despite Andre's attempts to stop her. Kirill talks to Andre for the first time since their departure from the monastery, assuring him that harming a holy fool is considered bad luck and a great sin, and that Durotska will be released unharmed. Andre still does not speak despite Kiro's pleading. 
Instead, he continues his menial work of carrying large hot stones from a fire with tongs to heat water for the monastery, dropping one stone in the snow. Part 8. The Bell. Spring 1423 to Spring 1424. This episode concerns young Briska, whose father, an expert bellmaker, has recently died in a plague. He secures a commission for a bell from the Grand Duke, claiming he has peerless technical knowledge to learn at his father's deathbed. On sight, Briska constantly contradicts and challenges his father's old team of workmen, having his own way in choosing the location of the pit, the selection of the proper clay, the building of the mold, the firing of the furnaces, and finally, the hoisting of the bell. One worker who refuses his orders is flogged in punishment. Beneath his bold demeanor, Bariska is increasingly bothered by self-doubt. He notices Andre among the crowd of spectators. During the bell making, Andre is confronted by the Skuramak from the first sequence, who has endured imprisonment and torture and suspects Andre of having denounced him. Kiro, the true culprit, arrives and intervenes on behalf of the silent Andre. Later, he privately confesses to Andre that his sinful envy dissipated once he heard Andre had abandoned painting. He pleads with Andre to cease wasting his god-given artistic talent, but receives no response. The successful progress of the bell sends Bariska into a state of sunned, detached disbelief. He gives fewer orders and lets the work crew take over. As the furnaces are opened and the molten metal pours into the mold, he privately asks God for help. After completion, the bell is hoisted into its tower and blessed by a priest. The Grand Duke attends the ceremony, having threatened to execute Bariska and the work crew if the bell fails to ring. It is overheard that he recently beheaded his own brother for the raid on Vladimir. In the tense moments as the bell is set in motion, Durochka is seen walking through the crowd leading a horse and preceded by a child which is, presumably, hers. The bell rings perfectly and she smiles. Bariska, meanwhile, has collapsed. He admits afterward to Andre that his father never actually told him his bell casting secret. Andre, impressed by the effect that successful ringing has had on the rejoicing crowd, realizes the joy that his own art might bring. He, conf he comforts Bariska, breaking his vow of silence and telling the boy that they should carry on their work together. You'll cast bells, I'll paint icons. Andre then sees Drechka, her child and the horse, walk off across the muddy field in the distance. Epilogue the epilogue is the only part of the film in color and shows time-aged but still vibrant details of several of Andrei Rublev's actual icons. The icons are shown in the following order, Enthroned Christ, Twelve Apostles, The Annunciation, Twelve Apostles, Jesus Entering Jerusalem, Birth of Christ, Enthroned Christ, Transfiguration of Jesus, Resurrection of Lazarus, The Annunciation, Resurrection of Lazarus, Birth of Christ. Trinity, Archangel Michael, Paul the Apostle, and the Redeemer. The final scene crossfades from the icons and shows four horses standing by a river in thunder and rain. In 1961, while working on his first feature film, Avon's Childhood, Tarkovsky made a proposal to Moss Film for a film on the life of Russia's greatest icon painter, Andrei Rublev. The contract was signed in 1962 and the first treatment was approved in December 1963. Tarkovsky and his co-screenwriter Andrei Konchalovsky worked for more than two years on the script, studying medieval writings and chronicles, and books on medieval history and art. In April 1964, the script was approved, and he began working on the film. At the same time, the script was published in the influential film magazine Iskustva Kina, and was widely discussed among historians, film critics, and ordinary readers. The discussion on Andrei Rublev centered on the socio-political and historical, and not the artistic aspects of the film. According to Tarkovsky, the original idea for a film about the life of Andrei Rublev was due to the film actor Vasily Levanov. Levanov proposed to write a screenplay together with Tarkovsky and Konchalovsky while they were scrolling through a forest on the outskirts of Moscow. He also mentioned that he would love to play Andrei Rublev. Tarkovsky did not intend the film to be a historical or biographical film about Rublev. Instead, he was motivated by the idea of showing the connection between a creative character's personality and the times through which he lives. He wanted to show an artist's maturing and the development of his talent. He chose Andrei Rublev for his importance in the history of Russian culture. Tarkovsky cast Anatoly Solonitsyn for the role of Andrei Rublev. At this time, 
Solonitsyn was an unknown actor at a theater in Sverdlovsk. According to Tarkovsky, everybody had a different image of the historical figure of Rublov, thus casting an unknown actor who would not remind viewers of other roles was his favorite approach. Solonitsyn, who had read the film script in the film magazine as Gustavo was very enthusiastic about the role, traveled to Moscow at his own expense to meet Tarkovsky, and even declared that no one could play this role better than him. Tarkovsky felt the same, saying that, with Solonitsyn, I simply got lucky. For the role of Andrei Rublov, he required a face with great expressive power in which one could see a demoniacal single-mindedness. To Tarkovsky, Solonitsyn provided the right physical appearance and the talent of showing complex psychological processes. Solonitsyn would continue to work with the director, appearing in Solaris, Mirror, and Stalker, and in the title role of Tarkovsky's 1976 stage production of Hamlet and Moscow's Lincoln Theater. Before his death from cancer in 1982, Solonitsyn was also intended to play protagonist Andrei Gorkachev in Tarkovsky's 1983 Italian-Russian co-production, Nostalgia, and a star in a project titled The Witch, which Tarkovsky would significantly alter into his final production, The Sacrifice. According to Johnson, filming did not begin until April 1965, one year after approval of the script. With J. Oberman reporting an earlier date of September 1964 for the start of filming, and his film essay for the Criterion Collection release of the film. The initial budget was 1.6 million rubles, but it was cut several times to 1 million rubles. In comparison, Sergei Bonarchuk's War and Peace had a budget of 8.5 million. As a result of the budget restrictions, several scenes from the script were cut, including an opening scene showing the Battle of Kulikovo. Other scenes that were cut from the script are a hunting scene, where the younger brother of the Grand Duke hunts swans, and a scene showing peasants helping Duretska give birth to a Russian Tatar child. In the end, the film cost 1.3 million rubles, with a cost overrun due to heavy snowfall, which disrupted shooting from November 1965 until April 1966. The film was shot on location of the Neural River in the historical places of Vladimir Suzdal, Peskov, Izborsk, and Petkori. Tarkovsky chose to shoot the main film in black and white in the epilogue, showing some of Rublov's icons in color. In an interview, he motivated his choice with the claim that in everyday life, one does not consciously notice colors. Consequently, Rublov's life is in black and white, whereas his art is in color. The film was thus able to express the codependence of an artist's art in his personal life. In a 1969 interview, Tarkovsky stated that the flying man in the prologue is the symbol of daring, in the sense that creation requires from man the complete offering of his being. Whether one wishes to fly before it has become possible, or cast a bell without having learned how to do it, or paint an icon, all these acts demand that for the price of his creation, man should die, dissolve himself in his work, give himself entirely. The color sequence of Rublov's icons begins with showing only selected details, climaxing in Rublov's most famous icon, the Trinity. One reason for including this color finale was, according to Tarkovsky, to give the viewer some rest and to allow him to detach himself from Rublov's life and to reflect. The film finally ends with the image of horses at river in the rain. To Tarkovsky, horses symbolized life, and including horses in the final scene, and in many other scenes in the film meant that life was the source of all of Rublov's art. The first cut of the film was known as Andre Passion. The Passion according to Andre, though this title was not used for the released version of the film. The first cut was over 195 minutes in length, prior to being edited down to its released length. The first cut was completed in July 1966. Goskino demanded cuts to the film, citing its length, negativity, violence, and nudity. After Tarkovsky completed this first version, it would be five years before the film was widely released in the Soviet Union. The ministry's demands for cuts first resulted in a 190-minute version. Despite Tarkovsky's objections, expressed in a letter to Alexei Romanov, the chairman of Goskino, the ministry demanded further cuts. And so, Tarkovsky trimmed the length to 186 minutes. Robert Byrd, in his analysis of the comparison of the first cut of the film, to the final Tarkovsky cut of the edited film summarized the editing process, stating, The most conspicuous cuts were the most graphic shots of the stonemason's gouged-out eyes, the burning cow, 
and the horse being lanced, although its horrific fall remained. Four embedded scenes of flashbacks or fantasies were also cut completely. Foma's fantasy of flight in episode 2, Andre's reminiscence of the three monks under a rain-soaked oak tree in episode 4, the younger prince's fantasy of humiliating the Grand Duke in episode 5, and Briska's recollection of the bell thonning in episode 7. All in all, I have counted 36 shots, which were completely deleted in the 185-minute version of Andrei Rublov, and about 85 which were considerably abbreviated, including 9 very long takes, which are split each into two or more parts. The total number of shots went to 403 to 390, with the average shot length dropping from 31 to 28. The only sequence which remained inviolable was the epilogue in color. Several scenes within the film depict violence, torture, and cruelty towards animals, which sparked controversy at the time of release. Most of these scenes took place during the raid of Vladimir, including one showing the blinding and the torture of a monk. The scenes involving cruelty towards animals were largely simulated. For example, during the Tartar raid of Vladimir, a cow was set on fire. In reality, the cow had an asbestos-covered coat and was not physically harmed. However, one scene depicts the real death of a horse. The horse falls from a flight of stairs and is then stabbed by a spear. In a 1967 interview for Literaturna Abrogene, interviewer Alexander Lipkov suggested to Tarkovsky that the cruelty in the film is shown precisely to shock and stun the viewers. And this may even repel them. In an attempt to downplay the cruelty, Tarkovsky responded, No, I don't agree. This does not hinder viewer perception. Moreover, we did all this quite sensitively. I can name films that show much more cruel things, compared to which ours looks quite modest. The film premiered with a single screening at the Dom Kino in Moscow in 1966. Audience reaction was enthusiastic despite some criticism of the film's naturalistic depiction of violence but the film failed to win approval for release from Soviet censors. The Central Committee of the Communist Party wrote in its review that the film's ideological erroneousness is not open to doubt. Andrei Rublev was accused of being anti-historical in its failure to portray the context of its hero's life, the rapid development of large cities, and the struggle against the Mongols. In February 1967, Tarkovsky and Alexei Romanov complained that the film was not yet approved for a wide release, but refused to cut further scenes from the film. Rublev was invited to the Cannes Film Festival in 1967 as part of a planned retrospective of Soviet film on occasion of the 50th anniversary of the October Revolution. The official answer was that the film was not yet completed and could not be shown at the film festival. A second invitation was made by the organizers of the Cannes Film Festival in 1969. Soviet officials accepted this invitation but they only allowed to film the screen at the festival out of competition, and it was screened just once at 4 a.m. on the final day of the festival. Audience response nevertheless was enthusiastic, and the film won the Fipresky Prize. Soviet officials tried to prevent the official release of the film in France and other countries, but were not successful as the French distributor had legally acquired the rights in 1969. In the Soviet Union, influential admirers of Tarkovsky's work, including the film director Grigory Kazintsev, the composer Dmitry Shostakovich, and Yevgeny Surkov, the editor of Iskustva Kino, began pressuring for the release of Andrei Rublov. Tarkovsky and his second wife Larissa Tarkovska wrote letters to other influential personalities in support of the film's release, and Larissa even went with the film to Alexei Kazigin, then the premier of the Soviet Union. Despite Tarkovsky's refusal to make further cuts, Rublov was finally released on December 24, 1971, in the 186-minute 1966 version. The film was released in 277 prints and sold 2.98 million tickets. When the film was released, he remarked in his diary that in the entire city not a single poster for the film could be seen, but that all theaters were sold out. Despite the cuts having originated with Gus Kino's demands, Tarkovsky ultimately endorsed the cut of the film over the original 205 minute version, saying, Nobody has ever cut anything from Andrei Rublov. Nobody, except me. I made some cuts myself. In the first version, the film was 3 hours and 20 minutes long. In the second, 3 hours 15 minutes. I shortened the final version to 3 hours and 6 minutes. I am convinced the latest version of this is the best, the most successful. 
and I only cut certain overly long scenes, the viewer doesn't even notice their absence. The cuts have in no way changed the subject matter nor what was important in the film for us. In other words, we removed overly long scenes which had no significance. We shortened certain scenes of brutality in order to induce psychological shock in viewers as opposed to a mere unpleasant impression that would only destroy our intent. All my friends and colleagues who, during long discussions, were advising me to make those cuts turned out to be right in the end. It took me some time to understand it. At first, I got the impression that they were attempting to pressure my creative individuality. Later, I understood that this final version of the film more than fulfills my requirements for it, and I do not regret at all that the film has been shortened to its present length. The original 1966 version of the film, titled as The Passion According to Andre, was published by the Criterion Collection in 2018 and released in both DVD and Blu-ray format. In 1973, the film was shown on Soviet television in a 101-minute version that Tarkovsky did not authorize. Notable scenes that were cut from this version were the rate of the Tatars and the scene showing naked pagans. The epilogue showing details of Andrei Rublov's icons was in black and white as the Soviet Union had not fully transitioned to color TV. In 1987, when Andrei Rublov was once again shown on Soviet TV, the epilogue was once again in black and white, despite the Soviet Union having completely transitioned to color TV. Another difference from the original version of the film was the inclusion of a short explanatory note at the beginning of the film detailing the life of Andrei Rublov and the historical background. When the film was released in the US and other countries in 1973, Columbia Pictures cut it by an additional 20 minutes, making the film an incoherent mess in the eyes of many critics and leading to unfavorable reviews. In the mid-1990s, Criterion Collection released the first cut, 205-minute version of Andrei Rublov on Laserdisc, which Criterion reissued on DVD in 1999. Criterion advertises this version as the director's cut, despite Tarkovsky's stated preference for the 186-minute version. According to Tarkovsky's sister Marina, one of the editors of the film, Ludmila Feganova, secretly kept a print of the 205-minute cut under her bed. Criterion's producer of the project stated that the video transfer was sourced from a film print that filmmaker Martin Scorsese had acquired while visiting Russia. In 2016, a Blu-ray version of the film was released in the United Kingdom using the 186-minute version preferred by Tarkovsky. Criterion released both the first and final cut of the film on DVD and Blu-ray in September 2018. Andrei Rublov has an approval rating of 95% on review aggregator website Rotten Tomatoes based on 43 reviews and an average rating of 8.9 out of 10. The website's critical consensus states, Andrei Rublov is a cerebral epic that filters challenging ideas through a grand scope, forming a moving thesis on art, faith, and the sweep of history. Jay Hoberman, a film critic for The Village Voice, summarized the early reception of the film in the film notes included in the Criterion DVD release of the film, stating, Two years later, in 1973, Rublov surfaced at the New York Film Festival, cut another 20 minutes by its American distributor, Columbia Pictures. Time Magazine compared the movie unfavorably to Dr. Zhivago. Those other New York reviewers who took note begged off explication, citing Rublov's apparent truncation. Andrei Rublov won several awards, in 1969, it was screened at the Cannes Film Festival. Due to pressure by Soviet officials, the film could only be shown out of competition and thus was not eligible for the Palme d'Or or the Grand Prix. Nevertheless, it won the prize of the international film critics, Fipresky. In 1971, Andrei Rublev won the Critics Award of the French Syndicate of Cinema Critics, and in 1973, the Juicy Award for Best Foreign Film. The film is referenced in Tarkovsky's two films that followed this one. It is first referenced in Solaris, made in 1972, by having an icon by Andrei Rublev being placed in the main character's room. It is next referenced by having a poster of the film being hung on a wall in Mirror, made in 1975. In 2011, director Joanna Hogg listed it as a film that changed her life. In the 2012 Sight and Sound polls, it was ranked the 26th greatest film ever made in the critics' poll and 13th in the director's poll. In the earlier 2002 version of the film, the film ranked 35th among critics and 24th among directors. In critics' poll by the same magazine, it ranked 11th and 24th in 1982 and 1992, respectively.
In 2018, the film ranked at number 40 on the BBC's list of the 100 Greatest Foreign Language Films. As voted on by 209 film critics from 43 countries, in the Soviet Union, the film was harshly criticized and censored for its gloominess, excessive naturalism, anti-historicalness, and anti-patriotism, as well as for cruelty to animals. Subsequently, it was recognized as one of the director's main works. It is included in many lists and ratings of the best films in the history of world cinema. The Russian wiki goes into more detail. Tarkovsky submitted an application for the film in 1961, that is, before Avon's childhood. The contract was concluded in 1962. On December 18, 1963, the literary script was accepted, and on April 24, 1964, it was launched into directorial development. Stanislav Lubshin was tentatively approved for the main role, but then Tarkovsky chose Anatoly Solonitsyn. Filming began in September 1964 and ended in November 1965. The film's editor, Lazar Lazarev, recalled Tarkovsky during the film's production. I was amazed by his inexhaustible supply of physical and mental strength. On the set, he was always collected, energetic, and never missed anything. He had such a powerful charge of inner energy, such a selfless obsession with creativity that it could not help but infect and captivate the people who worked with him and under his leadership. A significant part of the film was shot in the Peskov region, and Peskov, Izborsk, and Pekori. Film also took place in Sizdal, near the Sponsor Efimiev Monastery. The scene of the hot air balloon flight was filmed near the Church of the Intercession on the Neural. During the filming of the fire in the Assumption Cathedral in Vladimir, a real fire started. To simulate the fire, smoke bombs were prepared, which were supposed to be placed on metal trays with sand. However, there was no sand poured on them, and the hot smoke bombs heated the trays, which caused the wooden rafters to catch fire, and a real fire started, which was soon extinguished. Tarkovsky planned to include a short story about the Battle of Kulikovo with large-scale battle scenes in the film, but due to budget problems, he was forced to abandon this idea. Roland Baikov refused the help of a dance master in preparing the buffoon's dance, and prepared it himself. The buffoon's ditties performed by Baikov and the music for them were also written by him. When the actor was preparing for the role, he studied the issue, and it turned out that the authentic ditties of that time completely contained obscene language. In the finale of the film, Shimorik tries to hack Andrei Rublov to death with an axe, whom he unfairly considers an informer. Baikov thought such a bloody ending was false, and he resorted to trickery. He grabbed an axe, prepared for an attack, and immediately whispered in Tarkovsky's ear, Listen, Andre. Skomorik swung, but he couldn't hit. Tarkovsky immediately appreciated Roland's find, and filmed the scene in his interpretation. Anatoly Solonitsyn remained silent for four months, so that his voice would sound hoarse during the filming of the episode of Lifting the Vow of Silence. In 1967, a limited premiere took place. The film caused mixed feelings among the film authorities. The authors were accused of promoting violence and cruelty. The film was re-edited and shortened. In fact, the picture was shelved. It was released in limited release in 1971. The truly wide premiere of the restored film took place in 1987. The film became an event in the cinematic world for the first time in Soviet cinema an epic view of the spiritual, religious side of medieval Russia was presented. The three main characters, as if opposed to the Christian trinity, demonstrate the clash of people with different characters, and all the events are shown through the eyes of the protagonist, the director's namesake. As Maya Turovskaya wrote about the film, This is a huge cinematic cycle about the life and deeds of an artist who, unlike social utopias, is capable of transforming the world into harmony. The religious and philosophical issues of the film alarmed not only Soviet cultural officials. For example, Alexander Solzhenitsyn condemned Tarkovsky for simplifying and distorting the spiritual atmosphere of Rublov's time, presenting an arbitrary interpretation of medieval history, about which little is known. According to the writer, Tarkovsky's naturalism turns into heartlessness. Instead of genuine Christian spirituality, a chain of ugly cruelties is stretched throughout the film. Ilya Glazunov wrote, Andrei Rublev is presented in the film as a modern tossing and turning neuroaesthetic, unable to see the way, confused in his searches, whereas he created the most harmonious works, permeated with spiritual light. 
one gets the impression that the authors of the film hate not only Russian history, but, o but also the Russian land itself, where it rains, where there is always mud and slush. In a word, this film is deeply anti-historical and anti-patriotic. The film's characters speak modern Russian, and their speech frequently includes such anachronistic words for the 15th century as artel, interesting, material, and secret. In parrying accusations of distorting historical reality, Tarkovsky justified his deviations from the archaeological and ethnographic truth by striving to recreate a picture of the Russian Middle Ages for the modern viewer in such a way that it would not turn into a conventional picturesque stylization with a taste of monumental museum exotica. Film critic Jim Oberman noted the high density of the film's soundtrack. Somewhere in the background of the dialogues one can discern the crackling of a fire, the ringing of bells, the chirping of birds, living creatures, wild geese, a cat, a grass snake, ants, constantly appear in the camera. According to the film critic, the world created on the screen is so full of life that it threatens to spill out of the screen into the auditorium. Today, some authors declare the film Andrei Rublev to be an example of orthodox creativity. Tarkovsky himself avoided a direct answer to the question about his religious views and expressed dissatisfaction with the fact that the Western press linked his thoughts on spiritual freedom with the theme of religion or, in his words, churchiness. He said that he was close to the pantheism of Dushemko's early work. Publications over the years have reported cases of animal cruelty during filming, for example, Elisa Aksinova, director of the Vladimir Suzdal Museum Reserve, where the film crew worked, claimed that the cow was burned alive during the filming of one of the cutscenes. And in another scene, a tatter warrior in a cameo role played by a worker from the Vladimir Meat Packing Plant cut open a horse's neck while galloping. The final version of the film included a scene in which a horse breaks off a wall and falls, breaking its legs in the process. The newspaper, Veterinaya Moskva, published an article on December 24, 1966, discussing the cow incident and criticizing the cruelty of the filmmakers, although neither Tarkovsky's name nor the title of the film were mentioned in it. In response, Tarkovsky called the article in Veterinaya Moskva an insinuation, monstrous in its unfair bias, and regarded it as harassment, and noted that the horse was taken from a slaughterhouse and would have been killed soon anyway, while the cow was covered with asbestos and was not harmed. The statement by the director was confirmed by the film's director, Tamara Argorodnikova. I was present during the filming, and I had all of this with me. According to her, the cow was covered with asbestos and did not burn. However, Aksinova, who often clashed with Tarkovsky, said that There is no need to be disingenuous. The cow was indeed burned alive. Much later, in a 2012 interview, Tarkovsky and Orgornikovo's words were confirmed by Vadim Yusov, the film's cameraman. Yes, the cow was burning, but it was decorated with a special asbestos blanket. It probably got some burns, but it left the set on its own two feet. Stanislav Kunyaev, in his publication about Tarkovsky, referred to a conversation with Brezhnev's former aide Yevgeny Semataikin, who, when asked whether the cow had been burned, replied that, of course it had been. Kunyaev claimed that Semataikin had been involved in the story with the cow, received complaints, quelled discontent, made efforts to keep the story from getting into the newspapers and said that Tarkovsky had shots of horses being thrown from a bell tower, and the horses, falling, broke their legs. The information about the burning of a live cow caused a negative reaction. For example, Kira Muratova stated that she once liked Tarkovsky's films, but after she saw the cutscene with the burning cow on television, Tarkovsky ceased to exist for her. Yuri Maman called the burning of the cow extreme cruelty, and compared Tarkovsky to Raskolnikov, who believe that some people are allowed to cross the law. Stanislav Kunyayev dedicated the film Vladimirskaya Shose to the killing of the cow. However, according to Nikolai Broyayev, Tarkovsky's cruelty towards animals was justified and dictated by artistic goals, since it is necessary to show cruelty in order to lead the viewer to the realization of its senselessness. In 2017, in Suzdal, near the Spaso Ephemiev, monastery on the bank of the Kamenka River on the territory of the main tourist complex Suzdal. A monument to director Andrei Tarkovsky in the film Andrei Rublov was erected. It was there in 1965 that Tarkovsky filmed the short story, The Bell. In 2022, Moss Film restored the director's cut of the film, The Passion of Andrei, 
and included scenes and takes that were previously cut during editing. The total running time of the new version was 206 minutes. The film was published in 4K 2160p format. On Moss Film's official YouTube channel, the television premiere of the restored copy of the director's cut of the film, timed to coincide with Andrei Konchalovsky's 85th birthday, took place on the night of August 19th, 20th, 2022, on the Russia One TV channel. In October 2022, The Passion of Andre was released in cinemas. Now, what do people say? Can anyone please explain Andre Rublov to me? A post says. This will be my fifth Tarkovsky film. First was Stalker, even though I didn't like it. Still, it left a huge impact on me. I absolutely loved Mirror, Nostalgia, Solaris. I was excited to see Andre Rublov after reading its controversies, themes, and reviews about it. But I am finding myself very difficult to even finish the film. Currently, I have watched 1.20 hours of the film, and I am finding it very boring. There were many parts where I was finding very nonsensical how instantly Danil came in the fourth part, or why Rublov does not want to paint the Last Judgment. Like in the previous part, he was saying to those naked people that Last Judgment is coming, and you will be burned. So what happened in between the parts which made him realize that? There is one scene in the fifth part where a boy is reading a book, maybe the Bible, I don't know, and I am just not able to understand why does this scene exist, even though visually it's very beautiful like other Tarkovsky films, but I am not able to understand. What is the meaning, or what is happening? Maybe the reason is I don't know anything about Christianity, because I'm not Christian, and I don't know about medieval history of Russia. Please help me understand the film and its themes and elements. Replies say, It is a homage, a criticism, and a reminder of Russian history. Russian art is kind of filled with this idea that the Russian struggle and Russian virtues, due to that struggle, are special, and destined to improve the world save Europe from decadence and cynicism. That's the first major point of Andrei Rublov. There is a lot of ode in reference to the struggles of 14th century Russian Christians. As it is about the development and realization of how Russian virtues came to be, why they're so special, etc. It's also about the artist trying to perfect their art personally. The development of the uniquely personal, but not very special, art. It must be perfect, made beautiful, just like Russia, through struggle, trial, sincerity, and understanding of the world. The turning point and climax of the film is when both of these things are shown in their quest's essential form, the sacrifice of Christ, the creation of the bell, and the immortality of Andre's art. In short, it's about Russia, Christian virtue, metaphysical satisfaction, the art, the artist, and legacy. Ultimately, I feel Andrei Rublov is a film about human beings and their attempts at contemplating both the beauty and ugliness that surrounds them both the creation of art and the destruction of it, the thrill of invention as well as the thrill of war, and how man deals with that duality. It culminates only in what we are left with, in what we see at the end, the actual paintings in color of Andrei Rublev himself, all that he went through shown in his art. I don't think it means any more than that. Manakmiskra.com says, Andrei Tarkovsky's epic, poetic, and deeply religious film Andrei Rublev is a great character study of Russia's greatest icon painter, Andrei Rublov. However, Tarkovsky did not intend this to be a historical or biographical film. He wanted to unravel the life experiences of a great artist that inspired and shaped his art and artistic manifestations. Tarkovsky wanted to analyze the poetry of the timeless icons that he painted. The film shows medieval Russia from 1400 to 1424 and is divided into eight episodes with a prologue and an epilogue. Andrei Rublev features multiple incidents of the early 15th century like Tudor invasions, pagan rituals, rivalries among princes, etc. The film deals with atrocities like rape, raids, murders, betrayals, revenge, and punishment. But it also portrays love, peace, compassion, brotherhood, and deeply rooted Orthodox Christian faith. Andrei Rublev starts with a prologue where a man named Yefim takes a flight on a gas balloon that crashes on the ground shortly killing him. This prologue shows the daring nature of humans, who can even risk their lives for their passion. The rolling horse at the end of the prologue represents the hope that inspires us to keep moving forward in life. In the first episode, the three leave for Moscow. During a heavy downpour, they take shelter in a village barn, where a jester is entertaining villagers by mocking the state and the church. After some time, the state soldiers arrive there, knock him unconscious, smash his instrument, 
and take him away. In the second episode, Kirill arrives at the workshop of the Grey Penner Tiafanes. Where Kirill's knowledge impresses him, he invites Kirill to decorate the Cathedral of the Annunciation in Moscow. Kirill refuses initially, but accepts the offer only if Tiafanes personally visits Andronikov Monastery and invites him in front of the other monks, including Andrei Rublov. Shortly afterward, a messenger arrives at the monastery and offers the job to Andrei instead of Kirill. This offer to Andrei agitates both Daniel and Kirill to a great extent. Daniel refuses to accompany Andrei to Moscow, but wishes him good luck. However, Kirill can't control his anger and leaves the Andronikov Monastery for a secular world. While walking off the snowy yard of the monastery, his dog starts following him, but he kills the dog beating it with his walking stick. In the third episode, Andrei leaves for Moscow with his disciple Foma, who lies sometimes and is not interested in seeking the deeper meaning of his work. They meet Tia Faints the Greek in the forest where he only talks about negativities and pessimism in front of Andrei. He says that the Russian people are benighted because of their stupidity, and people will again crucify Jesus if he takes birth again. Andrei despises him for his negative mentality and talks about love, peace, sympathy, and brotherhood. He even says the people who crucified Jesus were also following God's orders. In the fourth episode, Andre witnesses pagan rituals while collecting firewood in the forest and gets caught spying. He is tied with a wooden beam in a hut with his hands raised upward. A pagan woman named Martha puts off her fur coat, kisses him being naked, and unties him. In reply to Andre's harsh criticism of her religion, Martha argues it is nothing but love. The next morning, a group of soldiers chases a few pagans on the riverbank. Martha's lover is caught, but she escapes swimming naked across the river, passing just by the boat, carrying a few monks, including Andre, who look away in shame. In the fifth episode, Andre and Daniel are decorating a church in Vladimir, but Andre loses inspiration to paint a terrifying and pessimistic subject like The Last Judgment. Foma leaves Andre to paint smaller churches. The Grand Duke is dissatisfied with the works of the artisans and orders them to paint the walls of his house as per his wish. However, the artisans already have the contract to paint the house of his brother. They proclaim that his brother's house will look more beautiful than his house. This irritates the Grand Duke, and his soldiers gouge out the eyes of the artisans making them blind. This terrifying act of revenge disappoints Andre heavily, and he throws paint on the walls of the church in anger. An innocent girl, Durochka, is dissatisfied to see the haphazard paint on the walls. Her innocence inspires Andre to paint a feast. In the sixth episode, the younger brother of the Grand Duke forms an alliance with a group of Tatars and raids Vladimir. The town, as beautiful as a flower, is completely devastated by the atrocities of the invaders. Innocent civilians are killed, women are raped, buildings are set on fire, and Andre's paintings on the walls of the church are completely destroyed. Andre kills a man to save Jurichka from getting raped by a Tatar. That magnificent town turns into a devastated land. The only two persons who remain alive are Andre and Durichka. Andre repents his crime and takes a vow of silence. The sudden massacre and atrocities make her completely insane. She is seen tying the hair of a dead woman while snowflakes are falling down over the destroyed church. In the seventh episode, Andre lives in Andronikov Monastery. But he neither paints nor speaks. Duruska also lives there. The Tatars stop in the monastery while crossing through that area. They are impressed by Duruska's innocence and play with her. Andre tries to drag her away but fails as she is attracted to the horned helmet gifted to her by a Tatar, who marries her as his eighth wife and takes her away. Kiro returns to the monastery and begs forgiveness from the father. The father pardons him. Kirill tries to make a conversation with Andre, but he does not reciprocate and remains silent. In the eighth episode, a young boy named Briska takes the onus to make a bronze church bell. He supervises the project of making the church bell, including the selection, pit location, building of the mold, firing of the furnaces, and the hoisting of the bell. He clarifies that his father secretly revealed the bell-making process to him. However, during the time of hoisting the bell for ringing, he has his self-doubts and can't believe that the bell can be ringed. Helplessly, he starts crying and praying to God, which Andre silently observes. When the bell finally rings, he breaks his vow and consoles Bariska that he has done a pretty good job. Andre also says that from now onwards, they will work together. Bariska will cast bells, and he will paint icons. During the bell hoisting ceremony, Daruska appears with her tartar son and goes away when the bell finally rings. Andrei Ublov has an epilogue section, which is the only part of the film in color, that shows the tireless iconic images painted by the great Russian painter. 
Tarkovsky differentiated Rublev's life and his paintings through color. Great arts are always born out of utmost difficulties and sacrifices. The film ends with four horses standing in thunder and rain. Rain and horses in Tarkovsky's films are recurring themes that signify hopes. In spite of all the atrocities, Andrei Rublev is a film about hopes, love, compassion, forgiveness, and brotherhood. Andrei Rublev is a deeply religious film. Tarkovsky himself was a strong believer in Orthodox Christianity, and the film is deeply inspired by that. Throughout the film, Anatoly Solonitsyn looks like Jesus Christ. Much like Christ, Rublev preaches love, compassion, forgiveness, and brotherhood. Tarkovsky presented Rublev like a replica of none other than Christ. Even though the title of the film is the namesake of the great Russian painter, he does nothing heroic in the film. Viewers never see him painting. He takes a vow of silence and does not speak in the latter part of the film. In multiple scenes, he is not present at all. Tarkovsky wanted to dig his life deeper and analyze the poetry behind his classic icons. He did not intend this film to be a biographical or historical film. The basic purpose behind making this film was historical representation over historical accuracies. More than Rublev's actions, the director was interested to portray his surroundings and associations. Tarkovsky wanted to highlight the life and culture of early 15th century Russia so that Rublev's creations could be comprehended better. This is a rare poetic film wherein a great artist digs as much as possible into the life of another great artist. Andrei Rublev features multiple iconic shots by cinematographer Vadim Yusov. The prologue section has some highly skilled overhead shots when the gas balloon takes a flight. Yusov's camera efficiently captures the crude facets of violence on the screen, almost throughout the film. It also captures the actions and emotions of Christ-like figure Andrei Rublev. Vyacheslav Otchivnikov's music resonates with the hardships of ordinary Russian citizens in the early 15th century. The remarkable background scores have been used in the seeds of pagan rituals, Christ's crucifixion, and the Tatar raid. Soviet authorities barred Andrei Rublev to be screened in the competition at the Cannes Film Festival. However, it was screened out of competition, where it won the Fripresky Prize. It is constantly ranked amongst the most important films ever made. And so ends the article. You could argue that there were both deeper meanings and not-so-deep meanings to every one of his films. It is, however, important to note that Tarkovsky himself said about his films, If you look for a meaning, you'll miss everything that happens.